Good afternoon, everyone. This is Rebecca Smith Aldridge, the Executive Director of the Mid Hudson Library System. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for what I believe is our third trustee briefing of the COVID 19 era. Uh, I'm joined here today with Casey Conlin, our Library Sustainability Coordinator, who's going to help us out with the Families First Coronavirus Response Act information for you today. Um, but we just want to assure you that we're going to record everything today. As Kirsten said, uh, I'm looking out my own window and seeing very dark skies and thunder rumbling, and I I bet some of you are hearing the same thing. So if uh, your electricity goes out or mine does, uh, we'll, we'll make sure we either re keep recording or uh, redo this event if I'm no longer uh, able to uh, keep going with it because of the weather today. Um, so again, thank you so much for being here. I can only imagine uh, just like uh, each of us are dealing with interesting changes to our lives because of COVID and other issues that are facing our society today. I know you have many places you could choose to put your time and energy this afternoon. So thank you so much for being here on behalf of your community's library. It really says a lot about the high level of commitment we see at our member libraries uh, to see trustees show up for events like this. So again, thank you so much. Our plan here today is uh, to uh, both give you a, uh, oops, sorry, I'm on the wrong screen, there we go, uh, to give you a, what I'm calling a situation report, just to give you a sense of you know, what's going on system-wide, something you can definitely tell what's going on at your library, but maybe give you a little bit of the bigger picture of what we're seeing at the system level, since we're serving five counties and 66 libraries. Uh, then we're gonna do some you know, quicker updates, things about funding at each level that impacts your library, local, county, state, and federal, uh, including a little update on what Mid-Hudson is contending with with the state aid cut that was uh, uh, revealed uh, in the past two weeks. We're going to give you uh, some insight into the open meetings law, uh, not only the executive order, which I think you're pretty familiar with by now, but a very recently issued advisory opinion from the Committee on Open Government, uh, which is important that we all understand. Uh, this is a, a topic that's very close to your heart since that's one of your primary points of contact uh, for your service is those open board meetings. So we want to make sure we get your questions answered about that. We're going to talk a little bit about facility considerations. Everyone out there is doing such a good job to respect social distancing and follow all the guidance that's out there. Uh, we just want to provide some clarity on some of that uh, for just in, in light of some of the questions we've received. Then we're going to take a, a little bit of a deeper dive on uh, two topics here, staffing in the time of COVID and supporting families in the upcoming school year. Uh, I'm sure all of us are following, uh, particularly the school year, uh, conversations in each of our communities and watching families struggle uh, with uncertainty and fear about what is coming next. And we just wanted to talk a little bit about that in terms of how libraries are helping to support families uh, throughout the coming months. We have two little calls to action we want to talk to you about, and then we'll just uh, give a little review of the upcoming trustee education series that's coming. Um, but I just want to say we're going to pause between each of these sections uh, to make sure questions get answered. As Kirsten said, please do use the questions box to ask your questions at any point during the presentation. Casey's going to help moderate them when we take breaks for questions. Um, so we know this isn't always ideal. Some people love to be uh, unmuted and talking, but again, given the volume of people we have on the call today, we thought it best to, to use that methodology once again. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, we've got uh, the situation report section here to jump into. Uh, what we've done here is created a chart uh, to give you a sense of the uh, 70 library locations. We have 66 libraries and there's four branch libraries making 70 locations. Uh, to give you a sense of what it looks like across the system, who's got their doors to their building open uh, and at what kind of level they have them open. So it's really great to see that 100% of our libraries are open now in terms of in-person services. Our, our libraries really never closed, just the facilities did. Um, but the facility obviously is central to many of the services that we provide. So we've got 100% of libraries providing some level of in-person service. And that is a real testament to the work of your director, your staff, and yourselves to get those policy decisions made, funding reallocated where it needed to to get those things done, and a lot of creativity to figure out how to provide socially distanced services. So you see we're about 46% are doing curbside service, and most of the directors on the line would tell you they're actually doing curbside plus and that's taking a number of different formats we have some libraries who are offering printing and faxing services uh, at basically curbside some libraries have uh, basically curbside computer service with tents and laptops set up we've got curbside to go uh, kits uh, craft kits and programming kits out there. So libraries are getting really creative of what curbside service looks like. So it's, it's not just about handing over a stack of books to someone. It's really trying to create as many points of contact as possible using that curbside model uh, to make sure that social distancing is being respected, but while we're trying to serve our public as best we can. 
Now we've got about a third of the libraries who have produced limited access to the library building. So that, again, is taking a number of different forms. Sometimes it's by appointment that people can come in and use the library's computers, or uh, we have uh, like the Putnam Valley Library is doing um, what they're calling browsing hours. Uh, so they're you know, dedicating certain levels of hours on certain days for browsing the library's collection on a limited uh, time scale. So maybe you can come in for 15 minutes, take a look around, pick out your own stuff. Uh, we've also got metered access in terms of, okay, the doors are open, but there's an occupancy cap here that only this many people can be in the building to make sure we can still affect the social distancing procedures that we put in place. So we're seeing all different kinds of configurations. And what I've been most impressed with is how the libraries are basically iterating on a regular basis. They're trying something, they're going back to the drawing board sometimes and saying, yep, that works great, or this aspect didn't, and they're, they've got this attitude of continuous improvement uh, to make sure they're keeping library workers and the public as safe as possible while still delivering quality library services. So it's been really impressive to watch. Uh, you've got some libraries that are classifying themselves, you know, doors are open, come on in, and that probably just has the occupancy cap there where they're keeping a door count of who's coming in the building, uh, but those are the libraries that have really no time limits on how long you can be in the building and those are definitely skewing towards the larger libraries with with a lot of square footage uh, for people to spread out in and then we've got uh, seven six libraries that have identified that the buildings open programs going on it looks very similar to what it did in February except with of course all the social distancing procedures in place um, so again each library is doing what they're able to given their local conditions and you'd be surprised at the the variations in the local conditions we've learned about over the past month. I've, I've asked the directors a lot of questions about how they're doing what they're doing, how they're making decisions, what's guiding what they're doing, uh, and there is a, a lot of stories out there. We have some libraries dealing with staffing level issues, that they have multi-floors in their building and not enough staff to enforce social distancing across multiple floors. We have libraries still in the midst of facility modifications to uh, do their best job when it comes to monitoring social distancing in the building, and uh, we have libraries that are contending with uh, a, a change in status where they they had perhaps uh, gone to level D and reopened the building with social distancing and then due to staff getting sick with COVID or a family member getting sick with COVID that they have to be the primary caregiver with saw that staffing level decrease to the point where they couldn't maintain those levels. So we want to acknowledge these numbers are definitely in flux. We've got a handful of libraries that are, are looking to change uh, their level they're at moving to limited access to the library building in the coming month. However, we know this is uh, not a black and white issue that libraries are dealing with a, a variety of challenges uh, and a variety of resources to meet those challenges. So it's, it's a super interesting time to take a look at what's going on and I, I just wanted to put these numbers in front of you to give you a sense of, of what it looks like out there because I think it's hard sometimes without that reference point uh, to see uh, where your decision making puts you uh, in the, the scheme of everything that's going on in the system. So we really appreciate that your directors have been so forthcoming with what they've been doing and reporting to us. It's been incredibly helpful to understand the data that we're seeing and how it correlates to the decision that are being made locally. Um, so again, we'll continue to track this information. I think it, it's really good for us at the system as well as to help member library directors um, with some of the tough decisions that they have to make uh, in the really in the reality of, of COVID-19, which you know, of course none of us have been through this before. We're all doing our best with the information we have at hand. Uh, so again, kudos to, to you all and your directors for uh, getting to where you are today because I know it has not been easy uh, and we'll continue to keep our eye on best practices and uh, update that phase reopening plan as new guidance emerges, uh, which you know we, we're keeping a very close eye on, on what, what's being said at the state level, the federal level, CDC guidance, the Realm report results. We're doing our best to continue to synthesize that information for you all. Uh, and I know many of the directors have helped us with that research as well. So again, in a, in a very big, uh, very real way, it takes a village these days to make this all work. And, and we thank you for being a part of that village. Uh, taking a look at the uh, the electronic resources usage in our system, as you can imagine, our e-resources were very, very popular during New York pause while, while most people were staying at home uh, because of the executive orders that were in play earlier this year. It, it had an amazing, I think, uh, revelation for people who didn't realize how much their library had to offer. Since March 2020, we've signed up 5,000 new library card holders, and that is very much thanks to 65 of our 66 libraries, all but one have adopted online library card registration now. So it really bridges that gap between people identifying that they really want what a library has and being able to get 
almost immediate access to those resources, just like you would on a commercial website. And I just want to give a shout out to the tech op operations staff at Mid Hudson, Lori Shedrick, our technology operations manager and assistant director. She prioritized that early on in March and really did a lot of outreach to help libraries get up and running with that. And it had a direct uh, obvious result here with 5,000 new library cards issued and people made good use of those cards. You know, our existing users as well as our new users, they uh, were taking a look at OverDrive and Mango Languages and e-magazines and we're just seeing, of course, record usage of those as that was one of the only ways people could access library services. So when you look at the charts on the right, you're seeing 2020 numbers with the recognition that those numbers were pulled in July, just over halfway through our year, and they're topping what annual numbers looked like in the previous years with significant increases. Increases. So, you know, it's a, it's a good lesson to us all to understand we've uh, really, I think, grown our market for our online resources, and, and that may have some both short and long-term uh, implications that we'll, we'll need to think about, and that's definitely some of the work and discussions that are going on through the Central Library and Collection Development Advisory Committee of the Directors Association. Uh, it'll be a centerpiece, uh, part of a, a webinar series coming up in, in, eight, in October for, for library staff, uh, but I think these, these stats are super important to take a look at. This is what patrons are looking for. It means we're meeting their needs in many ways, but of course, you know, it can never be enough, right? Anytime you ask patrons what else they'd like to see, they ask for more and more and more, um, but we have to find balance in how we develop both our e-collections and our print collections, and that, that's part of library science for us to figure out what that looks like in the coming months, uh, because it certainly looked different in the past six months than it looked uh, last year, and we're going to continue to think that through, I think, in a professional way. And so, again, we appreciate the libraries that really rethought their budgets in the past six months, reinvested I think in e-resources to meet this need you made a lot of your patrons and members of your community and new patrons very very happy um, so again I think it's a, a real testament to the the hard thinking that was going on out there of how we meet people's needs under under difficult circumstances Physical items, of course, with you know multiple months of library facilities being closed, we're not circulating physical items, uh, and it's making a slow comeback. Uh, it's down by about 57% from the same time last year, and I don't think that really surprises anybody when we think about what we're going through. We've got you know buildings that uh, many people don't realize are now offering curbside service or in-library service. So not only do we have to get the word out about what we're currently doing, we also have people who are still not comfortable coming out into public and interacting with staff. So I think we're seeing kind of a very slow comeback. It's been a, you can see that trend line there. It's, it's kind of flattish, but definitely rising. Um, so we're, we're seeing it come back slowly. And again, I think that is just due to the variations of, of people's experiences right now and the mixed messaging that's out there and, and concerns people have about being out in public. So I think it's it's never too much to get the word out about what the library is able to offer right now and how you're doing it safely to encourage people to interact with the library and library resources. Um, but it's a good acknowledgement that uh, right now it certainly doesn't look the way it used to, just uh, like it didn't a few months ago when we had the facilities closed either. So I just wanted to throw out there a couple of emerging trends that we're, we've picked up on from feedback we've gotten from directors and what we're observing ourselves. The advent of curbside service, patrons really like it. Uh, we've heard from almost every director who's doing curbside, which is all of them at this point, that people love it. And most directors are saying they're going to they're gonna retain curbside service, even if we got, when we get beyond the whole COVID era and things look far more normal than they do right now. Um, so that's very interesting to think about staffing and procedures for that, um, but also also to recognize that because of the COVID crisis, it, it, it really forced us to be creative and come up with some service models that our patrons are, are actually really liking. Uh, the obviously, e-resource is more popular than ever, and it's a, it's a hard lesson, right, that increased investment is called for. And that's one of the real challenges of, of library budgets always, that it's never like either or. It's not like we get to stop buying one thing completely and now we buy this new thing over here. It's usually an end statement, that we still have public that wants print and we have a growing interest in the e-collection. And so that takes some new thinking of how we budget for those things and really understanding that it's not necessarily a one-for-one -one flip uh, from one area of the budget to another, but it, it's likely going to mean more money invested in e-resources uh, coming up. It's becoming a major service point. If you think about the service points in your library from the front desk interactions when people are borrowing physical materials to the youth services work and, and programming that goes on at your library to reference services, e -resources resources are really, I think, becoming a service point almost unto itself um, that needs dedicated staff and uh, budget uh, de dedicated to it. And that's definitely an evolution.
evolutionary step for boards to be thinking about. It's not going to be fixed overnight or even in a year, um, but it's something that with steady attention, I think we can continue to improve upon. Now, libraries have done an amazing job harnessing technology uh, from that online library card registration advent I mentioned to, of course, online programming. We've seen the production value of online programming in our libraries continue to rise. Uh, online programming is another service that seems to be here to stay. Uh, even though we're still struggling with how on earth we would possibly do indoor programming, uh, I think that even once that becomes more doable and, and safer for people, I see libraries talking about online programming still going to be part of the menu that they offer the community to access content uh, through their library. So again, making sure staff are trained in that, having policies related to that, all those things that we uh, kind of did by the seat of our pants. Now we have some breathing space perhaps to take a look at how we make that work as best we can for the long haul. And it also presents opportunities for new partnerships, both by presenters and with other libraries that are nearby. I recently saw a library in Dutchess County partner with a library in Putnam County to co-promote a program they were doing online. Um, so it may mean some new opportunities to stretch budgeting dollars. Chat reference made a comeback. Chat reference, for those of you who don't know, is answering reference questions online through a chat box. Uh, it's almost like you know, texting your librarian uh, to get an answer to a, a question, and whether that be that question be to win a trivia contest or uh, really because you need some local information about a social service agency that's really critical to your everyday life. Uh, I think it's so interesting from a just as a, a study, as someone who's really studied library science for a long time, how chat reference had its heyday in the 90s, and now we're seeing it make a comeback thanks to COVID. Um, so that's very cool to see. Now libraries have gotten super creative with tech support. We know that uh, so many people rely on the library to come in and use those public access computers or to connect to the library's broadband internet connection. This is a massive issue for so many people in our community. You'll hear us use the phrase again and again, the digital divide, that not everyone has access uh, to computers. We have a lot of people below the poverty line that their only access to the internet is through their smartphone, which is very hard for students that are being asked to work from home and do homework from home to do so on a smartphone, if you can imagine what that would be like. Uh, we've also got people who might have the device but don't have the connectivity and they're looking to come to the library or be in the vicinity of the library to access the Wi-Fi that the library is able to provide. And so libraries have gotten very creative for you know understanding that people need to come through the doors and use computers. Uh, okay but the way we used to do that and when someone needed help was a staff person standing very close to them and helping out with pointing at something in the screen and so to make sure that we're keeping library workers as, as safe as possible in this environment while still meeting the needs of our community we're seeing libraries use programs like quick assist for in-house tech support which allows the staff person to be at their desk but still help someone at the public access computers which is pretty cool or even doing tech support online for people who are at home with their own technology and need some support the library staff can help out by doing uh, tech support by appointment online which has become a, a growing area that's been popular for residents across the region. Now the other very cool thing uh, we're seeing are new types of partnerships, wider amounts of partnerships. I gave you a couple examples here that we've picked up on, on the county level. Columbia County Library Association partnered with the Columbia Land Conservancy to do story walks uh, in the county, which if you're not familiar with, they are so popular right now. Google it, uh, learn more. It's very cool. It's a way for people to be outside and keep their kids engaged and, and getting a little literature as well while they're going along their walk. Uh, Dutchess County Libraries pooled their resources resources bought a new database in the face of what was going on here today and that was definitely I think pushed I don't you know they might have done it on their own uh, regardless of COVID but I definitely think it accelerated working together to do that kind of work Green County's coordinated reopening a beautiful thing to behold uh, watching them have joint messaging they had a one voice talking to the county's uh, government reopening committee uh, the Putnam County Libraries did a countywide talent show done uh, online which was super fun Ulster County did an amazing job coordinating summer reading program kickoff countywide so their promotion could be done countywide. Just fantastic partnerships and collaborations across the county. I, you know, I seriously have another dozen, two dozen examples I could give you of, of individual libraries working together or three or four libraries working together, but it's just great to see the Mid-Hudson community really pull together and, and help each other through this in really new and I think creative ways that are, are enhancing services to the public. 
So again, so much stuff out there. And, and I know many of you are library geeks like, like I am and, and following libraries across the system on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, uh, just to see what they're up to is super helpful. Uh, we've also seen, I have to point out that our library's graphic design game has really been bumped up. A lot of libraries are starting to use uh, free programs like Canva uh, or subscribing to something like Library Aware to produce a more professional looking social media post, which again is very eye catching and helping new patrons uh, or new card holders arise and, and connect with services that um, are really important uh, to the, their quality of life. So huge shout out to libraries who are just trying. They're just doing new stuff. They're figuring it out. They're doing their best to connect with new people uh, and finding new ways to do things. These grab and go craft kits and the East Fishkill Library's virtual volunteer opportunities. Uh, it's just wonderful to see the creativity and the, uh, I think the really going back to that idea of iteration um, that, okay, we're not quite sure what to do. Let's give it a try. If it doesn't work, we'll figure it out. We'll do a little forensic analysis analysis and, and try it again later. But I think if we don't try these new things, we have this uh, very real, uh, I think, concern of falling off of people's radars that you know it's been six months we've been in this crisis and people are finding new ways to do things new connections to get the things they're interested in and if libraries aren't you know iterating to be on that radar and still a part of people's lives when we take a look at those numbers of that you know we're about 50 percent of the circulation that we used to have we might not see that come back to the numbers that we saw in the first quarter of 2020 um, so again not letting go of that thread of how important it is to be on people People's radar, how to figure out how to get programming uh, to people, and and really thinking about how we measure success for the future. It's really never been about the number of things we've we've uh, circulated for sure. It's definitely about the outcomes we're helping people achieve in their lives. Are we helping to improve people's quality of life? Are we enhancing people's social connection in our local communities? Are we helping to support local businesses and local schools, local artists, local restaurants? I think how we measure success needs to be tweaked a bit uh, to make sure we're designing services. Services and, and outreach and partnership opportunities that really do speak to what our community needs both. So we continue to enjoy the support of our communities, both from a, a goodwill standpoint and a financial standpoint when they have the opportunity to make decisions about how much they invest of their tax dollars and their private dollars into our libraries. So uh, always something to keep at, at, at top of mind for trustees, of course, as the uh, people who are tasked with the financial stewardship of our organizations. Uh, and I just want to say from where we sit at Mid-Hudson, and your staff are doing a great job of helping you do that work. Um, the good press, um, the excellent responses on social media, the very happy people we see coming back to our libraries is just a great indicator that things are going as well as they can given all the challenges that we're faced with right now. But it does need consistent attention uh, as things are in flux as we think about the next few months. Uh, I just have to share that two of our libraries, and I, I just I so remember the moment with uh, Mary DeBellis, the director of the LaGrange Library. She said the first day they were open, for curbside service. Uh, someone came up to pick up their books, drove up, and when they saw the staff person burst out crying, they were so relieved to be reconnected with the library and have access uh, to the books they so come to depend on. And I just think it, it really speaks to that emotional connection some people have with your libraries and how really important from a social perspective, a financial perspective, uh, an educational perspective, libraries are in people's lives. And we, we can never lose sight of that as we think about how we get through the next few months. So uh, Mid-Hudson has been uh, thinking through how we do uh, work that supports you and supports your library staff. We've uh, put together a Reimagining Library Services series for your library staff, addressing some of uh, very acute needs like food scarcity, uh, but talking about, you know, let's surface all this innovative programming that's going on out there so we can learn from each other. Our libraries are so generous in sharing their good ideas with each other. Um, so we're gonna be featuring libraries that have been doing some really innovative work in programming, uh, highlighting those tech tools for library service, how uh, what's out there for free, what might be cheaper than you think, uh, how we're leveraging technology to make library service accessible in a socially distanced world, and then a really big topic, dealing with the digital divide, which is so critical today as we think about how kids are going to get through school, particularly if it's going to be done uh, remotely this year, which we're hearing more and more school districts contending with, at least for the first month here of school. Uh, we also have a new uh, series that will be announced very shortly about e-collection development and learning from those libraries that have been early adopters uh, of investing in their overdrive collections and fine-tuning their collections to make sure they're really attractive and highly used uh, by their community. So lots of good stuff coming up there for your staff.
Uh, so I just want to wrap up this portion, then we can stop for and answer any questions that have come up. Uh, just to, again, reinforce that I think our libraries are doing an awesome job of designing services and procedures and policies that protect library workers and protect the public. And I think if we keep that in mind, uh, concurrent to the health of our libraries, we're going to do uh, as well as we can during these challenging months. And I think the track record that libraries in this region, at least, have already come up with, uh, we're doing as well as we can. And I, again, just want to high five you virtually. Uh, so Casey, I'm going to pause here and see if any questions emerged uh, for this first segment of the, the day. So we did have a question and I wanted to encourage people if they have any questions now, please pop them in the chat box or or put them in the questions box and we'll try to answer them if we can. So Rebecca, you, sh you went over some pretty cool stats earlier uh, and we had a question about whether folks would be able to share out those statistics uh, on social media or with their community. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to send you these slides um, so you'll have the, the source material that you saw today. And if there's anything else you want, your director has access to stats, particularly for your library and our tech ops staff is there to support your director if there's other data um, that might be useful to get the word out about. All right, cool. Uh, so we also had another question uh, about um, the food insecurity program and folks wanted to know if that was exclusive to staff or if trustees could go as well. It's certainly designed for staff, and I feel funny talking about this, Casey, because it's your program. Um, <laughs> but you know, as always, we, we very rarely would close out a trustee from something. Uh, so yeah, I think if it's a super interesting to you, but understand it's designed for staff, and uh, we're not there to support uh, perhaps another agency that you might be involved in. But if you're interested in the topic, certainly you could come. All right, so I concur. And uh, that's it for the questions right now. All right, great. So we're going to move on to the updates. And as always, as questions occur to you, feel free to put them in the box or make a note that you'd like to chat with KCRI after the session. So update-wise, we're going to chat about funding, open meetings law, and facility considerations. I know not um, as much fun probably as the last stuff that we talked about, um, but it, really important stuff to make sure you have the lay of the land of what's going on out there. Uh, so funding update-wise, uh, we've certainly had a, a tough go of it over the past six months to figure out how to get library votes done. Um, it's hard actually for me to convey to you how much energy and time it took to fight for the executive orders that finally were produced to create solutions for school district libraries, 259 votes, special district votes, and 414 votes. And that, those are the four types of votes that really cover all member libraries uh, in Mid-Hudson, with the exception of the very small handful of libraries that don't have a public vote, uh, which are very vulnerable to uh, the whims of their municipality. So uh, I just want to point out that some of those executive orders are not as straightforward as we all wish. There's not a, a handy Q&A that goes with them. If you do have questions about them, uh, you can certainly send them my way if, if your director hasn't figured it out yet, and I'll do my best to help you out. I think in particular, the last two special district and 414 votes have been particularly challenging. Um, I'll start with the special district vote option. Uh, we have about a third of our libraries are special district libraries, and it doesn't necessarily look the way it did last year for your votes. Um, but for just to confirm for you, it is at this point an in-person vote uh, at your library, with the exception of one special district library who has their vote done by the Board of Elections. Um, so uh, there are uh, guidance out there for polling places that we hope your election officials have had. Uh, there was a recent executive order related to absentee ballots and making sure everyone in your community that is eligible to vote on the library special district vote understands your absentee ballot rules, how they get one. Uh, they opened it up so that we can all say that COVID-19 is a valid reason to request an absentee ballot, so you want to promote that heavily. Um, but again, there is no requirement for you to mail everybody an absentee ballot, and that was a lot of confusion over that issue as we saw the primaries in June had very special rules related to that. Those rules have not carried over for special district votes, uh, only that you allow for someone to say COVID is a valid reason to obtain an absentee ballot and opens up and perhaps prescribes a bit how they can request that absentee ballot and when they can request that's that absentee ballot. Um, I talked to a director last uh, yesterday, I guess, who they've actually never done absentee ballots, and so it was a good wake-up call they were supposed to, uh, and now they've got some sense of how to do that. Uh, the 414 votes issue, this is, uh, you know, a topic that I spend a lot, I was just, you know, I literally wrote the book on how to do these, so it's been incredibly frustrating uh, to watch uh, the fumbling of this topic at the state level. Uh, we finally got an executive order that allowed for this, then we had a fight with the state board of elections and local boards of elections of, no, you can't 
do this on the timeline the executive orders allowed for. Uh, we finally had a, a private attorney negotiate with the State Board of Elections to find a path forward for 414 four votes. We've done our best to um, communicate with 414 libraries as timely as possible directly, not wait for these briefings to bring this up because time was uh, of an essence there. Um, so for anyone who's an association library who wanted to do that 414 vote and you're like, what the heck happened? Uh, you are not alone. <laughs> it's, a, it's been a very messy uh, process. Uh, we did ultimately get authority to do it with petitions due on September 8th to uh, county boards of elections. If you're having any issues at all with that, let me know. Uh, it's a tough one with a very strict timeline. So county-wise, we've only heard from two of our five counties about how they're funding libraries. And of course, only four of the counties in our area get county money. Uh, but Columbia County and Ulster have all both been told they will see a cut to their funding, uh, much in line with what the state has been telling municipalities, including counties, what to expect in terms of cuts to state aid for themselves. Uh, so we, our hearts go out to those library associations. We know they are well prepared for those cuts. They had plans A, B, and C, uh, so they knew what to do and how to make Sure they could fulfill their contractual obligations. Really impressive work in those two county associations uh, from my observation point. So the big news from the state, uh, two weeks ago they let us know that uh, the state aid for libraries is the only line item in the state education department that has been authorized for payment. For anyone who's familiar with how our budget, uh, state budget pie chart looks, the education pie, piece of that pie is the biggest part. So to put that in perspective and understand that library aid is the only aid that's been authorized, that's huge uh, in terms of the advocacy work the Division of Library Development had to do with the Division of Budget uh, to make that happen. However, the news was not great in that we are seeing a matched, uh, what they call withholding of 20% of our aid. So you see the number 22.6 there, because if, you, if you'll recall, the budget that was passed back in April had a 2.6% reduction to library aid. So adding those two things together, uh, we're seeing a 22.6 reduction in state aid from the 2019 levels. So I first wanna talk about Mid-Hudson and then talk about the direct impact to your budgets. Um, if you weren't aware, state aid account for 75% of Mid-Hudson's operational revenue. This is obviously a massive blow to Mid-Hudson and we were not necessarily unprepared for this. We've been told from day one this was going to be bad and it was going to be rough and we, we've been taking immediate and consistent action to protect against this cut. Um, so has it meant uh, rethinking some stuff at Mid-Hudson? Has it mean, meant making hard decisions? Are there more hard decisions to come? Absolutely. Look at the bottom line of any organization, including your own library, and just imagine how you would manage a 22.6% cut to your bottom line, it's going to have impacts. So our directors have been wonderful in terms of providing us with feedback. Our system services advisory committee is designed exactly for this purpose and has put a number of things in place to guide decisions that we're making about this. We're currently operating under a hiring freeze, so staff that have left us in the past year, we have not refilled those positions. So if you uh, might think, well, Mid-Hudson you know, took an extra day to get back to me than they normally do, I just ask that you please have patience with our staff. Not only are we dealing with a different landscape just like you are in terms of the work that we're doing, we're also doing it with less staff at this point. Uh, we're down by one and a half people, and on a very small staff like ours, that makes a big difference. Um, so we thank you for your patience. Uh, we know there's more changes to come. And uh, if you have any questions about things you're hearing, seeing, wondering about, we're an open book. Our board is very transparent. All of our board documentation is on our website at midhudson.org. Our board is very open to questions you may have or concerns you may have. Uh, so we just want to say we are totally in this together. We understand the importance of the priorities you have in our service lineup, and we're doing our best to carry out what we've promised, uh, given the circumstances and the hand we've been dealt. We are anticipating uh, cuts going back into the next year, uh, understanding that this is not a one-year financial crisis. We're going to see a multi-year financial crisis here due to COVID. And again, Mid-Hudson staff and board are working diligently to prepare for that, to create scenarios, to deal with what might happen. Uh, it's a lot of lack of certainty for the coming years, and we're going to do our best with that. Uh, and we know that uh, you respect the work that the board is doing, uh, but they are always interested in hearing from you. They are your representatives on our board. And uh, I, I don't think I'm speaking on a term when I say that. Now there is one line, there is multiple lines of aid that comes from the state for various purposes. And one of those lines is the Local Library Services Aid or LLSA. That's a direct cash 
uh, check that comes to your library from the state that you have in your budget and expect to see in your account. So that initial 90% payment that your library is used to seeing, that will be reduced by 22.6% when it arrives. It has not arrived yet. Um, and so that final 10% that's always been held back is kind of the um, leverage the state uses to get other things out of libraries. There is some question of whether or not we will actually see the final 10% of the local library services aid. So we just wanted to put that in front of you, uh, make sure that was clear for your own budgeting purposes. It's never fun uh, when the majority of us here on this call have a calendar fiscal year and we still have uncertainty about funding here in the eighth month of our fiscal year. Um, so again, thank you for your patience. If you have any questions at all, you just let us know. Uh, the kind of uh, guiding star here that we've all been holding out hope for is that that 22.6 reduction would be mitigated by the inclusion of state aid in a federal stimulus package. Uh, as many of you are probably aware Congress went home without finalizing a federal stimulus plan. Uh, they are expected to be back at work uh, on this topic after Labor Day. I did check in with the Washington Office of the American Library Association this afternoon. They had a very dim view of you, any federal stimulus plan getting done, let alone getting that state aid in there. But as we know, things are in flux, things change, politics are shaping our everyday uh, pretty routinely. Uh, so again, not finalized, but but at this point, we knew we know for sure we're getting at least 22.6 less uh, than what we've uh, gotten in the, the past year, at least. So that was fun. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to talk about open meeting law and facility considerations, then we'll open it back up again for questions related to these three topics. So your open meeting law, uh, you've uh, gotten into the groove of meeting probably online for the most part for your board meetings, and the executive order adjustments allow for that, which many of us have been extremely grateful for and kind of wish it had always been allowed uh, in our world. But here we are today. So we just want to make clear that the adjustments do not mandate you to meet online. Um, but that being said, the reality of meeting uh, in person needs to have a reality check. Um, so there was an advisory opinion that has been released by the Committee on Open Government, which is the um, organization that's tasked with policing open meeting law. They finally issued an advisory opinion related to having in-person meetings in the time of COVID while the executive order that allows for online meetings is live. Um, so just a reminder that open meeting law adjustment has been extended through September 4th, and we've seen them really wait until the last minute each time to extend this. Um, there's no indication that it won't be extended again, um, but again, we have to wait and see what happens. So the Committee on Open Government got a lot of questions about this. Well, hey, if you're allowing in-person meetings, well, why don't we just go back to the way we used to do things? And their point is a very practical one, is that you cannot necessarily predict how many people may appear at your open meeting because it is open to the public, and that is the whole design of open meeting law, is the public has the right to come and watch you do the business of the library. Um, so their point, uh, in a, a pretty lengthy opinion, uh, is that you will likely have to also offer still a video or audio broadcast of that meeting to allow people to attend remotely, which still requires that recording and transcription of that audio broadcast. Um, so something that you need to keep in mind if you've switched back to having in-person meetings or you're doing hybrid meetings where some of your trustees are at home and some are at the library, um, there's likely going to have to be this, what they call contemporaneous video or audio broadcast. Um, so this is a, a direct quote from uh, Ms. Brule, who runs now the executive uh, She's the executive director of the Committee on Open Government. Uh, and so she kind of points out the unknown factor. And some of you are rolling your eyes right now because you're thinking to yourself, for the most part, no one ever comes to view your library board meetings. And so maybe it's not something to be too worried about. But the truth is you never know, right? You don't know who's going to show up. And so you need to be able to guarantee that you can create the social distancing necessary in that group, in the audience for the public participation. Excuse me. <clears throat> Okay, so we've gotten some questions about this. Excuse me. We want to be clear that the executive order does not undo the adjustments that have been made. So in the COVID area executive order adjustments, you do not have to put the location of where a trustee is attending the meeting if they're doing so remotely. You do not have to announce that location. You do not have to open up a trustee's home to the public. 
but it's saying that they would like to see an online option for the public that want to attend to watch that meeting if you're not able to create a socially distanced environment from which to view the work of the board during those open meetings. Um, so hopefully I didn't overcomplicate that. If you'd like to see the opinion, it's on the Committee on Open Government's website. We've also sent it to your directors, so they have it as a reference. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our third issue in the update section here is just the facility considerations. We went over them in detail when you were working on your phased reopening plans, uh, your social distancing measures of respecting the six feet of guidance, uh, six feet of distance guidance for staff workplaces, patron traffic flow, standing in any line the library might need people to stand it, and the service point modifications. From the plexiglass shield some people have put up or the redesigning of your, your circ desk area for libraries who have their doors open to their facilities, to where you're gonna store all those quarantine materials, how you're spacing out public access computers, how you're gonna handle tutoring as the school year gets cranked up here again. Um, these are all things libraries have been doing awesome work on. We're seeing kind of new things coming forth now in the, del the service delivery modifications. We talked about chat reference and quick assist for tech support. Uh, we're seeing programming done on both online and outdoors, which is really cool to see how libraries are doing outdoor programming uh, from concerts on the lawn to uh, nature programs outside and gardening programs and, and working on those procedures for how you help people be outside in a socially distanced way during a public library program. Obviously some new procedures and practices that had to be developed. The thing that uh, I think really traditional library users report missing the most is browsing the shelves of your library. Uh, my father is an avid library user and he always talks about serendipitous browsing. He never knew he wanted that title and he wouldn't have found it if he didn't have the chance to browse the shelves at his local library. Uh, so we're seeing libraries start to find new ways to do browsing of their collections from doing pop-up libraries at farmers markets and outdoor displays of books, so using social media to take pictures of new books that have come in and uh, alert people that these are available and you can here's how you can request them. Uh, reader's advisory, you know, a lot of patrons love just chatting with library staff. Oh, what's a good book in the mystery uh, genre this month? Uh, finding new ways to do that reader's advisory, which makes libraries so popular with uh, readers. Um, so work to be done for sure to, to figure that out and particularly to iterate on that when the weather gets cold and nasty, uh, doing uh, an outdoor display at a farmer's market is not going to be an option in the middle of January. Uh, so thinking that through is work that libraries are doing. But in terms of the latest guidance out there related to your facility, there was an executive order related to HVAC systems. And we want to make crystal clear that it was only for in for malls, for large malls, like the Galleria in Poughkeepsie, for example. However, they are recommending that other public buildings take a look at the filtration of their HVAC systems. And now we've got some libraries that have large buildings with massive HVAC systems. We've got a lot of small libraries that have you know, a window unit for air conditioning. And so this looks different depending on your building. But if you'd like more information on this topic, uh, the National Air Filtration Association has a very readable for a layperson uh, frequently asked questions page on their website. We'll make sure you have this URL for you um, that's clickable after the, the session today. Um, but if you've got questions about this, this is a great place to go. Uh, Casey and I read a lot, but we are not engineers or, or uh, HVAC professionals. So uh, our, inform our information on this is going to be pretty limited and we are going to refer you to uh, the experts both who service your local uh, HVAC systems as well as this National Air Filtration Association. Uh, Association. Uh, so just as we think through the considerations and where you're getting your information from, just a, a reminder, the top three places you're looking are those reopening guidance documents we got from the Department of Health uh, once we had the green light to reopen our buildings, the executive orders from the governor's office, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's guidance, the CDC guidance. Um, you may have uh, people approach you with a news story or an opinion about how things need to go, but I think as public entities, we need to make sure we're using factual information that's scientifically proven and respecting the science behind the research of COVID and how it's spreading. Um, so just just that reminder that there is a ton of information out there. There's also a ton of misinformation and unfortunately disinformation um, that has resulted in some, I think, scary things out there. Um, so as the governing body of your library, I encourage you to stand firm and, and use the, the science that's been approved by the public bodies that oversee our, our organizations to make these tough decisions. So we make sure we're keeping our library workers and the public as safe as possible as we move forward through this COVID crisis. All right, Casey, I'm going to stop here to see if there are any other questions related to these three update topics. 
Um, so anybody who has a question, please pop it in the question box or in the chat box. Uh, Rebecca, we did have a question and it was actually about universal class, which was a little bit earlier. We had a question about if there's a way to see um, the programs that are available through universal class, is there like a master list? <clears throat> That's a great question. I, I'm fairly sure there is on the knowledge base and your director would definitely know the answer to that, um, know where to find that. So we'll send that out to the directors to make sure you have access to it. Okay. And can directors get similar access about what kind of usage they're seeing in universal class and what kind of classes are being accessed, what kind of courses? Yeah, I'm not an expert in the, the data uh, that's available, but I know that any data that is available, Lori, our tech ops manager and assistant director, has built it into what's called the knowledge base, uh, kb.midhudson.org, which directors use to produce the reports and to make decisions about, is this being well used in my community or not? Uh, so your director has access to whatever data is available, and all directors who are on the call, if you weren't aware already, uh, it's on the knowledge base, and I just shoot the tech ops team uh, an email, and they can get you connected with that. Okay, great. So I don't see any other questions right now, either in the chat or in the questions box, but I'm going to keep an eye on it. And if anybody cool. has any questions as we're talking, please pop them in there. Excellent. Thanks so much, Casey. All right, our next topic is staffing in the time of COVID. This has been a topic we've been chatting with the directors at, at their last two director briefing because we can kind of see it coming. <laughs> some libraries are already having some issues. Uh, we've got kind of the, the just the reality check of what actually happens when one of your staff person is exhibiting symptoms or is tested positive for COVID or has a family member tested uh, positive for COVID. Um, or we've got a ton of staff who have school-aged children that are going to be impacted by decisions made by their school district and this puts a lot of pressure on your directors a lot of pressure to both you know, make sure that the staff are being cared for that they're following the law and, and policies that you've put in place it sometimes mean they're short staffed and might have to close down a service point if not a facility on some days we've already seen that happen in two libraries just in the past week uh, we've got uh, financial implications for people that need to be on a long-term leave and then also paying for coverage on top of that there's certainly a need for more trained substitutes and temporary workers and i think there's the overriding concern of staff morale we've asked a lot of our library staff over the past six months and they're dealing with not only that work at the library but also the realities of how covid and the financial crisis are impacting their personal lives. So we just put that before you to make sure that at your board, you've taken a good look at your human resource policies, um, that they are in alignment with law and that they are fair to your staff and that your director has the support they need to do what they have to do to make sure the library is staffed safely uh, to provide public library service in your community. So I've invited Casey here today and he's gonna talk about the Families First Coronavirus Response Act in just a minute. But just a reminder that in that phased reopening plan template that we gave you. There was a proactive infection plan that used the guidance from New York State to provide you with a policy you could use that in your library to know what to do when an employee or a patron tested positive for COVID-19. Um, so if you're wondering about that or maybe you missed that uh, as a board in terms of policy adoption or your director you know, maybe missed it when they were trying to get everything together, just a reminder that document is there and available and you can use it. It's been holding up pretty well from libraries uh, for what, from what they've told us. Um, so just a reminder that that's there. Now, one of the really complicated things about COVID-19 is the variety of bills that have been passed at the state and federal level related to providing paid leave related to COVID-19. And you might have heard when the governor created the do not travel list, or perhaps better described as the list of states that if you go to, you're going to quarantine when you come back, um, that he brought with that in his messaging a note that said, and if a staff person knowingly goes to a state that's on this list, they don't get the leave that's been approved by New York State, the paid leave requirement approved by New York State. That being said, there's a federal law that's also related to paid leave for coronavirus related quarantine that overrides what the governor said. And that was not apparent to a lot of people that manage human resources in their library. So we just wanted to give you a brief, brief overview of what the FFCRA is and how it intersects with the work you're doing at your library and, and just give you a sense of the complications your director's dealing with. So that was really confusing when the governor said that because he put uh, he said that people cannot get the emergency leave that the state had put out um, for people who are you know sick with COVID-19. 
uh, but it was pretty misleading, especially for our libraries, uh, most of our libraries and the size that they are, because a lot of the New York State leave wouldn't actually be applicable uh, to most folks who were quarantined. Uh, the federal leave um, comes into play when the state leave is not as generous or beneficial as the state leave is. And so in all cases, um, or in most cases that we looked at for our libraries, the federal leave uh, provides a more generous compensation and benefits and leave uh, package than the state leave. So in most cases, and at least until uh, December 31st, when the federal FFCRA program runs out, you're gonna be looking at federal leave, and this is the leave that you're gonna be providing to folks. Um, the federal leave, uh, applies for organizations that have less than 500 people. And so that's all our libraries. So this is applicable to your library likely. And the stuff that you're looking at on the screen here, these are a list of reasons that the FFCRA provides emergency leave for. And it's important to look at them all and see if you have staff who fall into this situation. This covers a lot of folks. And this was passed back in April. And in April, we were really concerned, I think, as a country, many folks were concerned with making sure that people didn't have to choose between um, getting a paycheck and going to work sick. And so this was designed to actually give people that option and say that you have the right to stay home sick. And so for reasons one, two, and three here, we see if you're subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine, and local would mean your local health department, or if you've been told by a healthcare provider to stay home, or if you have symptoms and you're seeking a medical diagnosis. So if you're symptomatic and you're getting a test and you're waiting for results, in that case, you're eligible for up to 10 days of leave at your normal pay rate. For reasons four, five, and six, if you have to care for somebody, who is being quarantined or has to quarantine for one of the reasons above, or if your child's place of care, if it's a daycare or some kind of care program is closed, or the school is closed because of COVID-19 reasons, or number six, which we haven't had to deal with too much here, um, something similar uh, to what we're dealing with here. Um, if they're if any of those conditions apply to somebody and they must take leave, uh, then they're eligible for two thirds of their pay. Back in April, um, it was maybe not hard to imagine, but I was hoping that we wouldn't have to deal so much with another condition of number five, which is that for number five, there's also attached if your child, if a person's school, if a person's ch child's school is closed, then they're actually eligible eligible for an expanded family medical leave um, of 10 weeks, and so that's kind of a long time. And so we just wanted to point out that there is a provision. Um, for um, for um, for uh, there is a provision for an exemption for this, and so the exemption applies not to any of the other reasons except for number five. So if the school is closed, if a person's child's school is closed, um, and they want to apply, or if they want to apply for the expanded fam family medical leave, which applies to when the school is closed. And there's a couple of requirements for the exemption. So the exemption is you have to have less than 50 employees, and then there has to be a determination made by an authorized officer, and that is the only real uh, description that we have. So that is a local decision, what an authorized officer is to some degree. Um, you have to determine that the provision of the leave for these folks would be a financial obligation that would exceed revenue. So if paying out the person would be more money than you took in, uh, that would be a good reason to not offer this leave or be exempt from this leave. leave. Um, and, or if the absence of the employee's specialized skill would be a substantial risk to the operation of the organization, or if there's not a sufficient pool to replace uh, the people who were uh, out on that leave. So the idea of having somebody go out and paying them two thirds of their pay for 12 weeks because you have the first two weeks and an additional 10 weeks, that's a lot of money, especially when you consider you'll probably have to pay somebody else to come in and replace that person. So there is a significant financial um, outlay that you would have to make as part of um, that program. And we wanted to make sure that you were aware of this exemption. So the 
flip side of this and the way that the federal government wanted to help support businesses rather than just simply saddle them with all this leave that they must pay is that there are payroll tax exemptions that the organization is eligible for. And so when you're making this determination, you're going to want to talk to your bookkeeper and your financial officer and see if you're eligible for any payroll tax exemptions that would factor into your decision to offer or to try to make an exemption for this type of leave. And just, sorry, Rebecca, do you have something? Nope. Okay. So just one more thing that we want to point out is that, um, you know, like I, you know, we've been talking a lot or I've been talking a lot right here about um, just, you know, the legality of this and the text um, and, you know, and what's in the FAQ of the FFCRA, which you can read here, questions 58 and 59 have a lot more info about this issue and this exemption. But uh, employers and employees, your staff, it's preferable that you can all work together and come to some kind of solution wherein people can still do their job and still serve the library and help out at the library and also take care of uh, their family and their children or whoever that they're also responsible for, if it's possible to come to a solution that provides both things. I think the word of the day is empathy. You know, it's empathy for our workers and workers' empathy for the institution and that idea that we need to find ways through this that respects both sides of that equation. Uh, and also making sure that boards don't fall afoul of the law, um, which is a really new law and affects policies in ways that, you know, are, are very new to all of our organizations. So we just want to make sure you had access to this information, knew where to learn more information. Uh, Casey's done a lot of studying to understand this, but, you know, we don't claim to be lawyers. So we are not. We know aren't. We're not lawyers, but we just want to make sure you're aware of these things. Uh, so when you're confronted with a situation where this might be called uh, into play, uh, you've got a fighting chance to understand it. So continuing on that theme of empathy, I think, is this uh, idea that you are probably, your staff is uh, might be thin, might need more uh, temporary workers or substitute workers. Uh, we've been sure to brief your directors on the support from Mid Hudson to get uh, trained, your, your staff trained, especially substitutes. Um, I don't expect for trustees to be very interested in this, but we just wanted to show that uh, we are very empathetic to what your staff is dealing with. And uh, we've done our best to be as flexible as possible with what we've both scheduled for people uh, in a, a system-wide way to customized options for training at your library or in, in a region of our system or for a whole county. Uh, we're very uh, willing to help libraries figure this out in terms of their staffing levels. Uh, continuing on that empathy theme is, is thinking not just inside our libraries, but outside of our libraries of what some uh, of our families are dealing with out in the community and how library resources are really well positioned to support families this school year. Uh, and a lot of what I'm about to say, I just want to point out, is not necessarily about your library doing many new things, but perhaps just getting the word out in new ways about what your library has to offer. When we think about the intersection of issues that come into play with the coming school year, it's pretty overwhelming for some people, um, from childcare issues to uh, the impact on employers in the community, uh, to unemployment support. It's, it's, there's so many things coming up in people's lives right now as they consider what's coming in the next few months. We think that libraries are a trusted organization to help people find solutions to what's going on. We certainly can't solve every problem people are being faced with. We can't provide childcare for people, um, but we can get information out there about what's available to make a parents' lives a little easier or to help kids who might not have access to their school library anymore. Uh, we are hearing that many school libraries will not open up their doors, uh, so that your public library may be the only game in town for kids to access resources that are going to help them get their homework done. And that's a pretty basic thing um, that families are going to need help with. So getting the word out about these and making sure we're packaging things and getting the word out is going to be really critical. Uh, we have so many assets at our libraries that help support for uh, school age children and really speak to student achievement in our, our region. Uh, so I would say let's make sure we're getting the word out there about what we have to offer. And if we feel like you know we need to boost our broadband connectivity, let's let's think about how we get that done because people are really going to need it. Uh, we learned that the hard way at the last half of the last semester, uh, and it's only going to be a bigger issue this semester as the reality of the situation sinks in for the coming year. So I think, you know, we're not here to solve this problem here in the next two minutes, uh, but we just want to put that out there. This is obviously a huge issue in your community, and the library is a, a great partner on this topic, and a lot of people don't realize that. So again, not about doing new stuff, but getting about the word out about what we already have to offer. Uh, totally in this together, so we need to make sure people realize 
as libraries are partners in what's coming. Uh, I'm going to do a, just a quick uh, two more things I want to talk to you about. We're going to respect the end time, but leave the door open for questions if you have the ability to stay for those questions to be answered. Uh, but I had two calls to action for you. Hey everybody, I think maybe we lost Rebecca's connection. Um, I see that she's out. Um, so I can't hear her either. I thought it was just me for a minute, but now I realize that it's probably all of us. So there are two, there is uh, at least one call to action that I know about, and that is from uh, the governor of New York. And he is actually looking for um, suggestions about how New York can build back better. And um, it is through an equity lens and also with an eye to broadband accessibility and technology. And so we wanted to have folks uh, get on there and let him know about the good work that libraries are doing uh, in this area and you know, encourage him to support libraries uh, in their work going forward because you know, we are always creating more equitable spaces and providing people with more access to resources um, through broadband connections. All right, yes, we'll see. We have FR, FFCRA questions. Um, so I saw somebody had a question earlier and they wanted to know if it applied to part-time staff or full-time staff. And so it does in fact part, apply to both part-time and full-time staff. Um, part-time staff would be paid um, for the normal amount of hours that they would work for that period. Um, full-time staff would be paid for whatever full-time is. Um, we have another question. Uh, Two-thirds pay apply to both full and part-time employees. Yes, it does. Uh, there's more information on the uh, FAQ link that we shared out earlier, um, or that was uh, available earlier in the webinar. And um, so the other thing, uh, so yeah, so there's more info on there. Um, it's uh, the FFCRA uh, questions FAQ, and we'll, we'll share that out with everybody in the email. Um, we have another question as well about um, how to communicate about um, how to build back better. And there is, when you access that form, there is a other or comment at the very bottom. It's a radio button. And if you tick that button, then you can go to a screen where you can fill in whatever kind of uh, question or comment that you want to provide to the governor. Uh, I suggest you keep it classy um, and talk about how great libraries are and how they support people in the community um, rather than saying just anything to the governor, as we may want to say to him sometimes. Um, so the last thing that we want to mention is we do have uh, some trustee education uh, online webinars coming up and they're um, open to lots of folks. We have a lot of uh, spots in there, so we hope that you can make it. We have trustees essentials coming up Thursday, September 10th and Tuesday, October 13th. Um, the, the Thursday event will be in the evening and the Tuesday event will be in the morning. We try to do that to make sure everybody has a chance to come. The core values and ethics, uh, where we'll be talking about policies, 101, that's what we called it. Uh, that will happen on Thursday, September 17th uh, at 10 a.m. and Wednesday, October 21st from 5.30 to 7.30. 
We'll also have uh, intermediate level workshops, financial and fiduciary responsibility, uh, where we talk about the uh, money and handling money at your libraries and the do's and don'ts of that and the legality. And we'll be hearing from Rebecca, who, uh, as we all know, has an extensive knowledge in that area. And that'll be Wednesday, December 2nd. And we have a legal issues course coming up September 22nd, right around the corner, where I will be talking about the new minimum library standards um, that will go into effect in 2020. And um, that'll be riveting. I know we all love looking at those boxes on the annual report. Um, and so, yeah, so tune in for that. Uh, you'll see more communications from us on the um, on the listserv and in the bulletin, but please sign up for these. Uh, we'll probably record them and share them out if we can, but if not, please come. We have a lot of spots. We saved a lot of seats for you. And I think we got Rebecca back if you want to wrap it up, Rebecca. <laughs> Thanks, Casey. That was a lot of fun. Uh, just as we <laughs> thought, there might be some issues with the storm and, and here we were, but I hear Casey took good care of you. Um, so the only other uh, thing I wanted to say before we got off the line here was to, to ask for your help in, in getting the word out about what our libraries are up to uh, and really tell the story because people do not know what a good job our libraries are doing. They have no idea what you're able to offer online and they don't realize to a large degree that they can access services in person now as well. Um, so we're calling on you you and your wide networks to get the word out about what's going on even telling a little story about how your library was able to help someone in the past few months we got to get the word out about that to not just the general public but stakeholders like our public officials and our elected officials who are doing their best to connect constituents with critical services we need to be part of that conversation um, so that was the, the last I think uh, big top talking point I had for you uh, we're uh, sorry for the technical glitch there with the the outage uh, I'm gonna hang out here and answer some more questions and we'll continue to record that but anything that we didn't get to before now um, we will make sure we, we get back to the individual with answers on it to make sure you get the info that you wanted today so Casey are there uh, outstanding questions for us today I think we got most of them okay great yep All right, so I'm gonna say thank you. Uh, thanks for bearing with us and that little technical glitch. I hope this was useful to you today. Uh, as always, you know where to find us if you have more questions or issues you'd like to discuss. And uh, I just wanna, again, thank you so much for your service to your library. Uh, it's really awesome to see you here today and, and we so appreciate you. Uh, so good luck and be well, and I'm sure we'll talk to you soon.